I'm delighted um, to uh, introduce uh, James Kelly. Uh, Jimmy Kelly um, is here from Dublin City University. Um, he's a graduate of University College Dublin. I also attended University College Dublin um, and uh, did my master's there, as did Guy Biner, uh, my colleague and Sullivan Chair um, in, in Irish Studies. Um, uh, uh, James Kelly was most recently um, the head of school, the, the School of History and Geography at uh, Dublin City U University. And his main area of research um, lies in the areas of Irish political and social history um, and focuses on the period um, from 1660 to, six, to 1860. Um, and in this area, he's published a, a number of books. Um, and uh, there are too many to cite here, but I'll mention a couple of them um, that are um, really landmark publications that have helped define the field. Um, that damned thing called Honor, Dueling in Ireland, um, was published in 1995. Henry Flood, Patriots and Politics in 18th Century Ireland, um, and uh, Sport in Ireland, um, 1600 to 1840. That was published in uh, 2014. His most recent monograph was titled uh, Food Rioting in Ireland in the 18th and 19th Centuries, which was published by uh, Four Courts Press in 2017. Just last year, the Royal Irish Academy published Climate and Society in Ireland from Prehistory to the Present. Um, that was published with uh, Tomás O'Carrigan. He is the editor of volume three of the Cambridge History of Ireland um, that uh, addressed the years 1730 to 1880. Um, that, um, uh, those four volumes were um, uh, launched here at uh, Boston College um, back in 2018, and all four editors, including uh, Jimmy, was here uh, for that event. Um, Jimmy is also an active member of a number of historical societies and bodies. He served as president of the Irish Historical Society, the 18th Century Irish Society, and most recently of the Irish, and, uh, economic, Irish economic and Social History Society. Um, he's uh, been wonderful to have here on campus. Uh, he's engaged with undergraduates uh, as well as the graduate uh, students and um, especially the faculty here in Irish Studies. And it's uh, a pleasure to welcome um, Jimmy Kelly. Please give a warm welcome to Professor James Kelly. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Jeeve. Is more on on our thumbs up they had either law her and law Philip Porrick and Shaw. It's I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as uh, <clears throat> Rob mentioned, I uh, had a first encounter with, with this August institution, at least this room in this institution, uh, some years ago when the Cambridge History of Ireland uh, was launched, and it was that it was such a, an encouraging and a stimulating experience that I was I was delighted to be able to both uh, apply for and be offered a Burns scholarship. And the, 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 certainly the experience has not been proving a disappointing. Now, I would like in the, in the context in which we're in, just to draw attention to just one wider contextual event. Recently, the Taoiseach of our country, uh, Michal Martin, of the Ireland, observed, and I quote, it's important that we come, when, when it's important that as we come together during the St. Patrick's Day Festival that we highlight and illustrate and show our solidarity with the people of Ukraine. I would just like in that context to express my own solidarity uh, with the people of the Ukraine and, and, and support the commitment that we've been asked to, to with the object of strengthening the global coalition in support of that country and its, and its people. Now my talk this evening is going to address the subject of Irish single street caricature in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Now, uh, <clears throat> the subject I say I want to wish to speak today is an overlooked dimension of Ireland's visual cu culture. It is that of single sheet, single sheet caricature. It is a term, I suggest, which partly explains itself, but I would like to say a few words to avoid any ambiguity. Many of you will be familiar with the United Ireland weekly Freeman images of the final decades of the 19th century, of which there was one on screen. These were what are known as chromolithographs, colored lithographic images produced with a technology that permitted mass production and which typically sold for one and a half pennies and were published as a supplement to the Freeman's Journal. They were, as is well known, 
partly relates to their appeal at the present nationalist in tone and theme. And they constitute a valuable visual accompaniment to the politics of home rule, the land war, and the cultural revival of the 1890s. My subject relates to a pre-existing form dating from a century earlier. <clears throat> During what was, I would suggest, the inaugural era of Irish caricature production. Between the late 1770s and late 1820s, with a final brief flurry in the early 1840s, single street sheet caricatures were published in limited editions on all sorts of themes and subjects. They differed from what was to follow, differed from, from these, in that they, they were, did not focus exclusively on politics or engage in national stereotypes. They were caricature image, images based on distorted and exaggerated renderings of people and situations satires, if you will, created with the deliberate purpose of mocking and thereby inducing the viewers to laugh at the person or persons being depicted or the situations in which they are portrayed. Moreover, since they were engraved from original drawings, then etched, printed and hand-coloured, they were printed in small editions. And as they were hand-coloured, I think you could even argue that they were each unique in its own way to, to a certain extent. Just two examples. They were priced accordingly. The cheapest and smallest might sell for five pence. The largest could cost as much as five to six shillings. They were also by a broader range of artists. Most are anonymous, in the sense of who the engravers were, but the Irish engravers and artists included, amongst those that we know, William Paulet Carey, Alexander MacDonald, and Henry Brokes, who I'll mention later. A majority of them were copied, mainly from English images by such well-known caricaturists as James Gilray, but there were a significant portion were original. So that is what I want to talk about. It's a, a category of Irish illustration, uh, which really has not been uh, fully uh, explored or, or examined. So I will try and speak about them in, under three headings. Firstly, try and provide the context and rationale for their study. Secondly, I'll seek to identify what I perceive are the main phases and the main publishers, because it's the publishers that is key. And thirdly, I will attempt to identify the extent to which there were both a copy of and a departure from those images that were produced in London. And I will throughout endeavour to illustrate the points with images, so that if what I'm saying really seems a bit uh, remote or, or not of interest, hopefully that the images will, uh, you will find the images at least somewhat as attractive as, and as alluring as I have. Now, part one then, I'll try and talk about the context and rationale. Ireland, or to more precise Dublin, since it was virtually exclusive based in that city, sustained a culture of single, street, single sheet caricature production during the half century 1780 to 1830 that was second only to that of London in Great Britain and Ireland. It's not entirely unknown. It features in the relatively recent Yale Art and Architectural volume. Got a couple of pages there. And more recently, there are signs with, with the appearance of an article in the Irish Architectural and Decorative Studies on William McCleary, who was one of the key figures in its uh, production in Ireland. That may well be an interest uh, emerging in the subject. But the subject remains significantly understudied. And it is a measure of how ill-informed we are we are, as to it at present, that it, we're not in a position, or I should say I am not in a position, to comment with any confidence on its scale, and still less to identify many of those who were responsible for drawing and engraving the many hundreds of images uh, that were printed in, in Dublin. One is still more in that sea in, times, in terms of identifying biographical details. Now, in some senses, because of the derivative nature of much of the phenomenon from, from London, it's tempting to perceive this as a provincial manifestation of a metropolitan phenomenon. I'm not certain that this is tenable, but nonetheless, I think I must acknowledge at the outset the extent to which London was both the cultural as well as political capital of the composite monarchy in which Britain and Ireland were bound until 1800. And then post-1800 was the the cultural, political, and parliamentary capital of the newly forged United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland that came into being in January 1800. At the same time, it would be wrong to conceive of Dublin in purely provincial terms. In other words, we ought not, 
overlook what was distinctive about the caricatures produced in Dublin, or accord insufficient notice to the fact that in the midst of the many Irish copies and Irish renditions of English images conceived by the likes of Gilray, and then we talk, talk about others like William Bunbury and Thomas Rowlandson and the, the, the members of the various members of the Cruikshank uh, family, there are scores of domestically generated images dealing with distinctly Irish subjects. <clears throat> and these are integral to how we characterize and define that pursuit as the copies of the most celebrated images of Gilray, Rowlandson, and particularly George Cruikshank. I think it's I suggest it is important that we do so, not only because by so doing we're engaging in a valuable act of recovery, which modest as it may seem to many, is I would suggest one of the purposes of history. But I think it has a purpose above and beyond that. If we examine these images, we'll be able to secure some insight into what people thought important enough to represent, to pay money for, and, and this is particularly significant, I suggest, to laugh at. Laughing is something that we perhaps don't necessarily comprehend historically or know exactly how to locate. But if, if one goes back to the, as far as the 19th century French poet Baudelaire, one can see evidence of, of, and for support for his argument that it is a means of incentivizing how we examine and explore and reflect upon the human condition. Humor is certainly integral to satire and to our appeal to verbal, written, and visual means to cast an ironic, cynical, and sometimes condemnatory comment on matters of concern in our lives. They need not be the great issues of the day. War, revolution, economic boom and bust might be their subjects, but they're not always. Interestingly, the single street sheet caricatures that were published in Dublin did not engage with the 1798 rebellion and its impressive aftermath. It did not engage with the subsistence crisis of 1799-1801, or the still more serious volcanic-induced crisis of 1815 to 1817, or the regional famine of 1822. But they do allow us to explore image, the imagery of certain key events. This, which we have here, is an Irish copy side by side with Gilray's original a portrait of an Irish chief, which was produced at the time of the 1790-1798 rebellion. There are images also, not exactly particularly of, the, of this quality or particularly fine, of the active union. There are images of the Catholic question in the early 19th century. There's a particularly revealing image, almost precocious image, in terms of identifying Daniel O'Connell, one, one of the earliest manifestations of, of his engagement with Irish politics, dating just from short of, of the time of the visit of, of George IV. There is our cartoons on the visit of George IV, and on particular events like the 1823 bottle riot, prompted when a bottle was thrown at a particular social event at the Lord Lieutenant as he was present. <clears throat> And there are some cartoons, though surprisingly small, I'll perhaps come back to this, on the subject of Catholic emancipation. And yet, when one was looking for them, one is struck by how many more caricatures and car cartoons there are of events and personalities of British politics and society. So in there, they feature William Pitt, Charles James Fox, George III, George IV, or before he was George IV, the Prince Regent, Queen Caroline, his ill-fated wife, and the divorce that they went through. International events. This is the accounts for the presence of General Sovorov, Russian general, who at that stage actually was a liberator of Europe uh, and playing a different, quite different role from, from the present. There are cr critical ones and fascinating ones on Napoleon and Napoleon's ill-fated campaign in, in, in 1812, 18, 1813. But it's the ones I think, I think that are more revealing, the ones that address social issues, that are, that are matters of social observation, ones that engage with clothing, with fashion, with dance styles, on military dress and behavior. Really, you know, all sorts of issues that one might not conceive from a historical perspective as necessarily important, but which provide us with the perspective on what people at the time thought were important. Things as obvious as, or for them and as troubling for them as a dog's tax as smoking chimneys, the theater, on the effeminacy of men, which seemed to be a particular concern uh, at, at this particular point in time. 
In some, while it could be misleading to imply that they encompass all of life, they encompass a lot. And they offer a nearly, un a nearly unique access to aspects of the world that we cannot gain insights into from the co correspondence of the leaders of state, from the records of the debates in parliament, or from the magazines, journals, and newspapers that chronicled the time in words. As a consequence, one can echo the view that this was an age of laughter that was different and distinct from that which followed, and indeed from that which prevails today. It was a time when irreverence, irreverence was respected, encouraged, permitted, choose whichever verb you wish. And this was manifest in an irreverence towards monarchy, towards the political elite, towards municipal and local politicians, towards clergymen, and towards the military. But it was also a time when snobbery, pretension, affectation were overtly challenged and satirized. If, as Vic Gattrell has suggested in respect of his study of this work in, in London, London was at the time, quote, a city of laughter, laughter, then so too was Dublin. Indeed, one person has, to my knowledge, described, maintained that one can, in this respect, talk about Dublin as, quote, the second city of laughter. I'm not personally sure what's the point of that, but what is clear is that next to London, it was the most productive center of caricature production in the composite cultural realm that was Britain and Ireland at the end of the 18th, beginning, moving into the 19th century. In, the, in terms of its output, it, it, it exceeded Edinburgh, which was third, and which had in John Kay a great biographical caricaturist. What it does, I suggest, provide us with an indicator of the mood of the theme of attitude that illustrates and suggests that the mood uh, at this time was different to, to, to that which succeeded and which we identify as Victorian. That sought and emphasized respectability. 18th century, late, early 19th century Ireland would appear not to have, have done so. It had a mood based on what we can conclude from the caricature as, as, a, as an emblem of, of identity and of outlook. It was a mood that was different from the moralistic confection of religion and nationalism that succeeded in Ireland in the 20th century, when societal, societal laughter, I emphasize, was largely suppressed. This is significant, as there is good case to be made that when the ability of a society to maintain the capacity to laugh at itself, <clears throat> is, it, it, it is healthy for it to do so, but it is also empowering when it does so. It can be a protection against overt over-seriousness. It's a subject to which we're all, I suggest, prone when the matter at issue is something about which we believe deeply or sincerely. Now, <clears throat> moving on, I want to try and begin by addressing what I identify as the main phases of this phenomenon of single street caricature in, in, in Dublin. There's a, an earlier phase, I would suggest, spanning the late 1770s, early 1780s, which witnessed a transition from a time when most of the caricature of Irish relevance was English in origin and published in magazines, to a period when single street caricature was becoming available for purchase. <clears throat> the leading Irish publisher of this form of, of, of print was a man by the name of William Allen who ran a print shop in Dame Street, Dublin, from the end of the 1770s. Now, Alan wasn't alone in, in producing a caricature uh, in this single sheet form at this period, and he wasn't responsible for producing a particularly large volume of material. He began by producing some political caricature in support of the patriot demand for free trade, uh, but he soon abandoned that and, and moved on to show a preference for the gently satirical images of William Bunbury, two of whose images are on the screen in, in front. Bunbury focused on domestic situations and particularly on gentlemen and their horses. He seemed to have a particular enthusiasm, I suspect born out of his own uh, gentry uh, background in England. Now, based on their price, and they were expensive by the standards of the time, minimum was sixpence, not unaffordable, but the more expensive ones could be multiples of shillings. They were, they were, his audience was the genteel. He certainly seems to have avoided the cheaper and more contentious end of the market, which was also beginning to take shape in the 1780s, which produced largely uncolored and frequently ill-drawing images uh, reflecting issues of political uh, argument at the time. 
Well, with Bunbury, I think we, uh, with uh, Alan and his uh, publication of copies of William Bunbury, we see a pattern being established, whereas uh, publishers in Dublin are set a pattern of copying English images uh, which others are to follow. <clears throat> There's two other images created in this period. One on the left is Bunbury, and the one on the, on the right is uh, from an English uh, car caricaturist by the name of Newton. Uh, not a particularly sophisticated image, uh, but the fact that it was p p published in Dublin, I think, uh, sustains the argument I would make that the, the 1790s, early, very early years of the 18th century, witness a, spe a developing phase in, 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 in caricature production that I would, I would identify as transitional. There was no identifiably dominant caricature publisher or engraver during these years, but the decade did witness an increase in the number of political caricatures graved in, in Dublin. These were not always sophisticated images, though they can be effective. And this one of John Foster, who was the Speaker of the House of Commons, I seems to me to epitomize one of the more effective ones. <clears throat> Foster uh, well, would be identified today with what we would perceive as, the, as a defender of Protestant ascendancy. He was particularly active in 1793, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, from which the Quincy's image days in, uh, dates in dealing with sedition. Um, and basically, so he's been presented there as, as uh, it, it, it allowed a more uh, the implement of preference being a scythe and just ho uh, scything up uh, manifestations of radicalism. And if you are acutely uh, observant, you can notice in the background uh, a, a very satirical gesture uh, being, 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 being expressed by uh, a president, which I, I take it as a comment on of the, the, the engraver uh, on, on Foster himself. This decade also sees <clears throat> Back to uh, Gilray again, the beginnings of the publication of more overtly satirical English images. Then was the, this one was the case in the 1780s. The image on the left is probably derived from Gilray. It's an interesting reflection and a rare image, both for, a, a, for any point in time, pretty much in Europe at the stage, of, of a visit to the dentist. Uh, not uh, a practice to be welcomed at the time, and you can, when, whoever disagreeable it may be to you now, and just imagine what it was like when it was, when it was being pursued then. But it's not until the end of the decade <clears throat> that we see a marked increase in satirical caricaturing. William McCleary was responsible for some of the previous images I identified which, which were produced in, in respect of the act, active union. But as McCleary's emergence at the, in, and his establishment of a shop on Nassau Street is that sets the tone uh, for the development and growth of caricature uh, production in, in Ireland. In the main, the caricatures that were produced uh, in the following years, a bit like the one to the right, which is, of, which is McCleary's copy of a comment on the, on, on the, on the D Dutch embarkation and in invasion scare in England in the early years of the 19th century. My perception is that the majority of those images uh, are not just copies, which is true of, of them in the main, uh, but they were reasonably safe. Now, if so, it is succeeded by a third phase, and when the amount of caricature production a, a, a escalates uh, dramatically. This coincides with the entry of, of James Sidebottom, an Englishman of uncertain background, into the expanding Irish caricature market. And it's against this background that we see, we see this major surge in caricature uh, production. It was also characterized by intense rivalry. A side bottom who set up on the fashionable site on, on Lower Sackville Street, just basically still only been brought into being nowadays O'Connell Street, and McCleary, who continued to uh, operate out of Nassau Street, competed aggressively for dominance of what really was a relatively small Irish caricature market. But the positive perspective, the positive outcome from our, our, our perspective was the publication of an unprecedented range of caricatures on a diversity of themes and subjects. There was also an exceptional amount of underhand practice. Sidebottom alleged that McCleary sought deliberately to undermine him by reproducing his images. I suspect he did, uh, but Sidebottom was not exactly uh, <clears throat> a free of, of, from the, of guilt in respect to this charge as, as well. 
What you see there anyhow on the images of the two is an illustration of how competitive the situation is, is that you've got an, an image, a really quite effective image, though it's a little reduced there, I, uh, <clears throat> I apologize for that, of John Philpot Curran on his, as master of the roles, uh, effectively identical, it was clearly one was produced to subvert the other, and then you got a side bottoms a, a, a version of one of uh, <clears throat> Gilray's uh, really quite marvelous images, uh, satires of two fashionable men who were preoccupied with with uh, blacking their boots. Uh, the original is in the in the, in the uh, <clears throat> National Portrait Gallery in, in in London, and if you happen to be there and ever see it, actually, it is worth just making a, a detour uh, to look at it. There was, what I'm suggesting, in other words, an enormous amount of counterfeiting. And this is, a, this is one of the manifestations and products of that uh, competition. The point about it, though, is there was no law. So what you see here is basically these are images that are, were, were drafted or prepared by Sidebottom in which he's satirizing and trying to expose what he sees as the underhand practices of McCleary. If he's right, the listing of images, which is on the, 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 the horn or the extinguisher, was hence the term, uh, would suggest that uh, McCleary was really uh, copying on an almost industrial scale. Uh, <clears throat> but the image is also valuable because it's the only visual impression that one has of what uh, uh, either Sidebottom or McCleary looked at. It's not the most flattering of, of images, but nonetheless, it does indicate uh, that uh, <clears throat> William McCleary didn't wear uh, a wig. Uh, that, he, well, I was going to say he, he didn't dress up. He probably dressed very ordinarily for the time, uh, but it does give a, 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 a side perspective. In any event, they were operating in an environment in which there was no law against this copying. And <clears throat> if it was uh, challenging to make a living, and it created uh, unhealthy or perhaps uh, unfair competition. It did have the positive virtue, as I suggested at the outset, of fostering the development and publication of caricatures on Irish political and social themes that enriched and expanded the options available to purchasers. The competition between these two men, anyhow, can be said to have peaked in 1814, which is when I date those two images that are, are on the screen, and resulted in some very intriguing, but also some commonly misread images. They're misread in this sense, and that the tendency, because these two were produced by Sidebottom, for people to perceive that McCleary was the, uh, the more unprincipled of the two, uh, when uh, Certainly on the basis of how Sidebottom conducted himself when he went back to London in 1815, he wasn't exactly the most principled of individuals, individuals either. More importantly, though, it strikes me that the competition contributed to the improvement in the quality of the caricature that was produced. I instance this, this as an example. Now, the man who's been caricatured here is not somebody I think anybody or many of you would ever likely to have heard. He was the brother of a, of a one-time Archbishop of, of Dublin. Uh, the Archbishop of Dublin at the time was a man by the name of Eusebi Cleaver. Now, by the time this caricature was done, he was senile, uh, so he wasn't going to even notice. But this was his brother, who was a, who was a don in, uh, in, 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 in Oxbridge University. And the original, which is by Dighton, uh, is part of a series of caricatures of Dons at the time, which actually I find really quite, quite attractive, even though it's quite difficult to try and link them, the images with personalities. But if you look at the caricature to the right, which is McCleary's version of it, I mean, it strikes me that there's an a, a, a active arc of caricature. It is far, far superior. And uh, well, uh, we haven't got the liberty here to actually to, 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 uh, 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 zoom in on it. Uh, the, the, the two aspects that stand out so visibly are his girth and secondly, the wart on his nose, uh, which is definitely, if it was there, is a highly, uh, uh, <clears throat> well, it lent itself to the exaggeration of which caricature was, uh, of which the emblematical, I should say, of, of, of caricature. In any event, by 1815, it seems that McCleary had won since Sidesbottom departs Dublin uh, to try and re well, I must say much read because I'm not sure he was there before, but try and start up a career in, 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 in London. 
The net effect of this is that William McCleary consolidates his place as the dominant force in the Irish caricature marketplace. Now, he didn't have the market entirely to himself. Joseph Le Petit, who had been an, an ally towards the end of Sidebottom's term in Ireland and who seems to have acted to some degree as a sort of a, a, an agent uh, for him for a short time, at least after Sidebottom's return uh, to, to, to London or to England, sought to fill in the space created by the latter's departure. Le Petit is a most intriguing individual. He had previously <clears throat> worked as an engraver and printmaker in London in the 1790s before coming to Dublin. And when he came to Dublin, he wasn't actively engaged in, in, in print production. Indeed, he has perhaps achieved a certain measure of, of, of renown in certain quarters as the, the publisher of some exceptionally high quality topographical scenes of Dublin. Any of you know the broadcast scenes? Uh, well, then you can uh, you'll know what I, well, of, of, uh, of which I, I, I speak. Those are the ones that came after the better known Noel Moulton uh, images. Le Petit published extensively, overwhelmingly English uh, caricatures, uh, <clears throat> but. He wasn't really in the market uh, and able to compete against uh, with McCleary, who's, uh, who consolidates his place as the leading caricature producer. And one of the areas in which he basically monopolizes and at least let me dominates is in his production of caricatures of, of fashion excesses. This was the peak period of the dandy. And the dandy lent itself a uh, to caricature for a variety of reasons, partly because of the effeminacy of, of their, the dress style, or as it was perceived, and which was seen as an offense by uh, the more masculine, masculine men. And, and, and secondly, because of their uh, the, 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 the disposition to dress, uh, in, 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 which lent itself to, to caricature. More generally, though, <clears throat> McCleary was alert to important niche markets. Because as well as the enthusiasm for the dandy images, he capitalizes on the interest in the Regency, and particularly of, of George, Prince of Wales, on the divorce of, of, of Queen Caroline and George IV, and on the bottle riot, and in, in the 1820s on the production of military caricatures. But Le Petit, by contrast, concentrates on producing English, Im, English images. But his reproductions of, of the Hogarthian image, and the one that's there is the cockpit, uh, which is one of a series, uh, is nonetheless, it strikes me as really quite intriguing and quite interesting, and not uh, insignificant in the, the, the history of, 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 of the Hogarth images. And I don't think it's an aspect of it that perhaps has been ever actually explored. In any event, the, the McCleary Le Petit era lasted about a decade, 1816 to 1825. And it's succeeded by the, what I perceive as the final phase, uh, uh, the final phase of, of, of this caricature production in, in, in Dublin, which is a little open ended. It begins in the mid 1820s, I suggest, and carries on a bit fitfully, arguably into the 1840s, though perhaps one's pushing the envelope a little bit by uh, linking the, the caricature images of Daniel O'Connell and Repeal in the 1840s uh, to this. Perhaps they just, they just stand alone. Now, why did the caricature world that was seen to be so vibrant just a decade earlier uh, come to a conclusion so rapidly, ostensibly, in the, in the mid-1820s? Well, I'm not sure, quite frankly, Maybe something to do with the changing fortunes of Le Petit and McCleary. Le Petit found himself in difficulties in the mid-1820s when he was arrested for the sale, or for his involvement in the sale of offensive uh, images. He was brought to court, and he basically, he's not, he, while the firm survives, carried on by his family members, he's not, they're not engaged in caricature production uh, thereafter. Coincidentally, by this point in time, McCleary also exited the business. So having been involved in it for 35 years, one perhaps can forgive him for that. Though he did leave for another decade, which suggests there may well be something going, go, taking place. At any event, my point is there is nothing in Ireland to compare with the extraordinary surge in political caricaturing prompted by the heated debate on Catholic emancipation that you can see in England in the second half of the 1720s. 
is not that there was no attempt to caricature the politics of Catholic emancipation. The film of Holbrook and Son produces some very antagonistic uh, caricaturing of the, the Catholic Association, which they call the Cat, the Cat Association, or just simply the Cat. Uh, and they utilize that image as a means of belittling and, 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 and downplaying it. There were others who engaged in slightly more benign uh, uh, image making. The film of Weishart, for example, uh, later on in the 1830s, the Ormond Printing House is engaged in some caricature production. Uh, but it's really very tame, it's very, and it's very small beer uh, by comparison with what's succeeded. His last hurrah, then, arguably, is the McCormick's images, the repeal images of, of the 1840s. It's a series of 12 historically interesting, but essentially artistically very naive images. That's there on the, on the right-hand side. Was, I've just taken one of them, which shows Daniel O'Connell uh, with a, 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 a birch uh, le le leathering uh, a, 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 a child. Now, moving on from this outline of, of, its, uh, of the trajectory of Irish image making, I want to say something finally on, on its, its character and on its uh, range. Basically, as I think a point of made clear in this conclusion you'll have arrived from the images that you've seen, is that whilst there was an indigenous element to, to Irish caricature production, it was highly dependent on the still more dynamic, indeed I would suggest ultra-dynamic London tradition. There's certainly nothing like it in the whole of the Atlantic world at this period in time. Now, there are a number of ways we can sort of examine this relationship. Sylvia Beltrametti and William Laffin have endeavored to do so looking at the quality of the images that William and McCleary uh, published. What they have suggested is that, when you're looking particularly at some of the quality of the coloring that you identify in some of McCleary's images, they are, they are reflective of, of, of a, a, a quality that oftentimes exceeds that in England. It's an argument that can be made. If you look there, you will see then there's basically to the left, you've got the Gilray original with the McCleary copy. It's, the copy is quite attractive, uh, but I think basically not only is it short in the background, but it just doesn't have uh, the anything of the quality uh, that you find in Gilray. Now, Gilray is by a, a street, you know, the most remarkable of the caricaturists of his period, so perhaps that isn't a, a reasonable uh, comparison. Let's move on and look at something slightly different. This is one of the two of the dandy images uh, from later in the, from 1818, later in the same decade. And basically what you see there is the Cruikshank original on the left with the McCleary on, 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 the, on the right. And to my mind, the McCleary one there has an advantage. If you're wondering why the reversed image, we can tell if they, they, how, how closely connected they are by the fact that one is a reverse of the other. It means it's a copy. Uh, but I think basically in this instance, uh, what you can, we, we, there is a mechanism of demonstrating by comparing images where, we want, where that is possible uh, to assess the quality. But I think we want to try and offer a slightly larger perspective on this, this phenomenon. And what I've been trying to do is provide, identify a, a, a way of assessing this statistically. Now, this is not an easy task. <clears throat> we do not possess an inventory of the single street caricatures published in Ireland. So basically, you're not clear about what proportion of images that, we are, that have actually survived. There's no major institutional catalogue or database of titles comparable uh, to the, 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 the Dorothy George seminal catalogue of prints and drawings in the British Museum, uh, which basically runs to all of 11 volumes and which was published almost over a period of, of, of a century. Interestingly, and not unhelpfully, it embraces the, those Irish caricatures that are in the collection of the British Museum. Uh, it's not unimpressive, but it's not, it's not, not, not complete. It's a start, but we can go slightly further in, in, in terms of trying to arrive at some sort of calculation as to the, the volume of Irish caricature, because Nick Robinson made one of his lifetime works to uh, build up a collection of Irish-themed caricature, and then he bequeathed it to, or donated it to Trinity College. It is the most comprehensive single collection of Irish caricature and is the logical starting point for any consideration of the single sheet caricature phenomenon in Ireland. But it too is not complete. 
and as I described it previously, as it's, 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 it's an Irish-themed caricature. It includes caricatures, a lot of which were made in Dublin, um, and, and as well as caricatures were made, which were made in London, uh, which have an Irish subject. And by, by particular question trying to ask here is what proportion or percentage are Dublin produced? <clears throat> The net effect of all of this is that trying to try and establish a database or a, trying to establish a, a sample sufficiently large of Irish caricature is, is involved as almost global uh, survey of museum holdings. And the, the collection and the figures on which I will be talking to you about presently in a, in a few, uh, are based on the holdings of the National Library of Ireland, the Victorian Albert Museum, the Bodleian, and the London Library in the UK. There's also smaller collections in the Wellcome Library, the National Maritime Museum, the National Army Museum. But what I found really quite intriguing and, and, and uh, <clears throat> satisfying, so when I embarked on this exercise, was the amount of material that has to be found its way across the Atlantic. The Library of Congress, for example, has a particularly good uh, collection of, 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 of caricature, mainly English, uh, but in the midst of this, when it's impossible to identify Irish material. The same is true of the New York Public Library, the Pierpont Morgan Library, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Chicago Institute of Art, the Lewis Walpole Library in Yale, and <clears throat> the Brown University. And given that I'm here, it would be remiss of me not to call out the Boston Public Library and Boston Museum of Fine Art, both of which I think hold one or two. Nothing spectacular, but nonetheless, uh, there are some there. Now, I've mentioned all those institutions partly to illustrate how widely scattered Dublin published single street caricature is, but also to highlight the contingent character of the figures I'm going to offer you. In other words, I'm still not clearer in my mind as to whether one has been able to assemble a reasonably full bit, uh, inventory of what was published or, if it's, or, or the extent to which it is less than complete. <clears throat> The problem is compounded by the fact that when it comes to assessing the nature of caricature in Ireland, one cannot, as in England, focus on the artist, the Gilrays, the Rowlandsons, and, and, and so on. Indeed, in a majority of instances, one cannot even identify by the, the engraver. That information is provided on, on London-based caricatures. It's not that we can't identify some of the, uh, <clears throat> those uh, people responsible the name's Alexander MacDonald, reflective of an individual who was active in the late, 18, or late 1790s, early 1800s. Henry Brokass, member of that extraordinarily talented family, uh, was also involved. And I've put up two examples of not, not especially remarkable images uh, to illustrate. Uh, but there's a large uh, anonymous uh, category. What one is obliged to do in that context, then, is focus on the publisher. And uh, this is where the absence of the extension of the Hogarth Act, which provided some sort of protection uh, to caricature producers in England from 1735, uh, is, is relevant. Why, though, were Irish caricature producers so uh, careful? And why was so much produced anonymously? Uh, I, it may well have got to do with the rich tradition of, of print piracy that we identify in Dublin, but I suspect it's probably something more to do with the application of the law of seditious libel as a means of corralling and curbing, a curbing debate. In any event, if we take this forward and try then to try and calculate what were is the uh, the, the ratios and proportions of material that is derived and that is domestically produced uh, and dis disaggregated, uh, we get some suggestive figures. Based on what William Allen was doing in the 1780s predominantly, I know he was active slightly longer than that, what you can see is that the majority of, of how his images are copies. His, his reliance on, on Bunbury is almost, you know, almost half the images we identify. Some of them were exceptionally good quality, but nonetheless, uh, <clears throat> they are copies. His reliance on others. The proportion which is domestically generated is quite modest in number, numerical terms, 11, uh, but then the total inventory isn't exactly, exactly huge. When you move forward, though, you can see that the, comp the proportion of Irish-made images is increasing. <clears throat> and this, an analysis of the surviving sample of McCleary, Sidebottom, and Le Petit publications 
which is shown on the table on the screen now, would illustrate that the, not only is the figures of increasing, but it ranged considerably. Joseph Liptit overwhelmingly was reliant upon English images. And while some of these are of high quality, mention his Hogarth derived images, uh, the proportion that he commissioned domestically from Irish uh, artists and engravers was, was, was modest. By contrast, with side bottom, you can see the percentages arrives to almost a quarter, and William McCleary is closer, closer to a third. The point about this is that I think it suggests that the, the competition between the two that, that uh, we've, we've touched on previously has the, a, a, a legacy, has an impact. And it leads to some really strikingly effective essays and satire, I would suggest, amongst them. We've previously looked at the image of, of John Philpott Curran as master of the scrolls, with a pun on his term as master of the rolls. The two uh, lawyers here on the left are, are was Burston and Leonard McNally, who is probably better known in certain quarters because of his, of his role in, in prosecuting, well, basically as a, uh, betraying the United Irishman and, and, as, as, a, and as a prosecuting uh, counsel. And the image to the right, which is really one of my favorites, which is the vigorous doctor, it's called, uh, or alternatively known as Dr. Whistle. And I try as I might, I haven't been able to identify who that actually is. I, my, my perception that it is a, a particularly effective is reinforced by the fact that it's one of the few Irish images that is also reproduced in London. In other words, they, the copying uh, tradition is one way rather than uh, uh, overwhelmingly rather rather than rather than two way, the two ways. Uh, <clears throat> but there are other uh, trends, other images that that stand out that are a product of this competition. Side bottom produces satires on the presentation, the controversial presentation of a petition against Catholic relief in 1813, in the process labeling the two Lord Mayors of Dublin and London, Dr. Noodle and, and Noodle. Uh, and then there's the, there's the race to get the caricature. It's just, it's, it, in terms of, it brings a perspective onto this issue at this point in time. I think that is singularly, is singularly a, a, a insightful. If McCleary then, produced in proportionately the highest number of caricatures of Irish origin, he probably provides then the fullest point of entry into the Irish, Irish single-sheet caricature tradition. <clears throat> he certainly, by the late teens, early 20s, has taken a monopoly in the, pu in the publication of caricatures of the Prince of Wales. Uh, these are copies of English exemplars, uh, but when you add, put those on top of the, the dandy images, uh, you can begin to get a sense of just how, uh, uh, one, one how dominant he is, um, but also basically how, uh, how, how alert he is to what the, what the Irish market was prepared to bring on, on board. The latter two images that are on the screen now are, again, more of the dandies. Uh, the dandy cock and stays, the first one, and the dandy, and the dandy zet which is the female uh, dandy. While all of this is interesting in terms of what was uh, copied, what is also revealing is to what is not copied. It is striking, for example, how few of James Gilray's major political caricatures, which are what attract the highest price in the present, were copied. The, um, the famous uh, one of, 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 of uh, you know, the, the, the goose pie, etc., are, are, are images that are simply you don't you don't don't find. We see little also of Piercy Roberts' iconic anti-Napoleonic corpus of images. It's not that either Gilray or Roberts were, were shunned. <clears throat> that is that is manifestly not the case. We can see, but what was seemed to have appealed more in terms of Gilray were his uh, social satire, if you like. The series here is two images, one of a satire on female grooming, and the second is a satire, satire on, on male grooming. There's the progress of the, to the, of the toilet and uh, <clears throat> dandy, the dandy dressing. His caricatures on medicine, the brisk cathartic, taking physic, easing the toothache, etc., are also, uh, uh, were also uh, uh, reproduced. 
The point in short, anyhow, is while it was the sheer number of English images that was produced in Ireland underlines the similarity of interests that the caricature buying community in both locations shared, they were not identical. And this is the, uh, an important point, I would suggest. We do not know enough about the circulation of caricatures to pronounce securely, but it seems reasonable to conclude not only that, caricature buying, that the caricature buying community was not representative of the population of large, but it, that it itself was also fragmented. And that those who were interested in buying caricatures of, of, of dandies, for example, were probably not those who were interested in buying caricatures of soldiers, or indeed the political caricatures that featured Daniel O'Connell or the Catholic, Catholic question. The point in is, in other words, it may be necessary to, whilst uh, exploring this shared cultural community uh, in terms of the interest in imagery that binds Dublin and London, is to disaggregate it into many smaller communities or cultural spheres uh, to identify uh, what uh, was, was, was going on. But in, on balance and in conclusion, one has to observe of the Dublin single street caricature single sheet character tradition, that it wasn't as large or as innovative as its London equivalent because Ireland produced no individual equivalent to William Bunbury early on, Richard Newton in the 1790s, or subsequently then the great geniuses that were Gilray, the Crookshanks, and, and Thomas Rowlandson. But the city of Dublin did possess skilled engravers, particularly skillful colorists, <coughs> who, if we could identify them, would add greatly to our understanding of the world of which they were a feature. If this cannot be done, we will have to continue to prioritize the images of themselves, securing the knowledge that as a cultural artifact, it has much to say both about the world out of which it emerged and the concerns and preoccupations of those to whom it spoke. And I'll offer you this one is by way of, of, of last image. This is a commentary on the Rockites, who in the early 18 20s uh, were an agrarian protest movement of some consequence. For the, those who viewed these, who bought these, were largely from the Anglophone, literate, urban, cultural community. They had disposable resources, but this was a community that reveled in the fun and enjoyment that came from sat satirizing others. And that, I suggest, is one of the reasons why it continues to have an applicability and relevance that we try and pursue it today. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, uh, Richard. Yes, thank you for that uh, very interesting talk. I'd like to ask you to unpack a little bit, um, perhaps one or two of the images politically. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the, the John, uh, you know, what, Curran and Master of the Scrolls. Um, what's going on there? I mean, is, it, is this satire about him being a lawyer? It, you know, is it the ascendancy side? Is it the Catholic background? What's the politics? Why is he riding a horse? Master of the Hounds, Master of the Scrolls? I just don't know. What's going on? I was thinking as I was looking at it of um, Foley, you know, the, the, the sculpture, who, who um, was from an Irish kind of national background and a, a, a local Dublin boy who became a sculptor, imitated the English sculpture at the end of the 19th century, um, did Albert and Victoria, but there was that, there was a subversive intent, there was a satire built into his representations of British Empire and British life. So he was imitating it, he was a brilliant imitator, but he also then turned it around, as Ronan Sheen shows in his novel, Foley's Agent, and Joe Cleary's written a lot about that too. So I'm just wondering if in all this work of um, portraiture, portraiture, there is something similar going on in terms of um, a, an Irish, or an Anglo-Irish indeed, um, you know, playing with the, the, the dominant English format and doing something with it? Or is it just, you know, the statistics of so many were produced in Ireland, so many were produced in England? I mean, what, what's the difference? What's the point? And my second question is, if this was going on as a very, you know, flourishing movement in, in portraiture and satirical portraiture, you mentioned Ireland was a city of laughing. 
And at the same time, you know, one would have the Midnight Court and a whole culture of laughter in Irish Gaelic culture. And I wonder, is there any access of that kind of laughter to, you know, that, that continues on subsequently right down to Miles and Magopoli, you know, and yeah. Taylor and Anstey. Is, is there any evidence of that particular culture in this kind of satirical portraiture? Or was that linguistic difference always kept? I, well, I'll deal with the second part first, actually. I think in the main, they're, they're, quite, they're quite separate and quite cut off from each other. Uh, I think they're quite cut off. Sorry, yes, I think they're quite cut off and quite separate. I mean, there's a chronological. I mean, well, Midnight Court, 1780. So, in one sense, you might suggest that actually that it 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 it, it, co it coincides temporarily uh, with the beginning of, of, of this phenomenon, uh, but the world in which they these they, they occupy. This is an Anglophone cultural realm, to my to my mind, and um, I I think that basically the the. My point in terms about its cultural subversiveness, or its, or not necessarily subversiveness, it's it's the significance of of the willingness to laugh at great institutions, and indeed to a certain degree, you know, in great men. But though I'll come to that in a second, is uh, has to be seen within the context in which it operates. It's 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 uh, it's not engaging in, in in a major. It's not trying to offer a major radical agenda for 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 change. We're operating in an environment here before Foley and before the, the nationalist tropes and the nationalist image, images and the national, nationalist perceptions that take heart in the 19th century have really taken anchorage. And I, think even, I don't even think they would actually have much appeal to the majority of the people who are purchasing these. I'm still wrestling, I have to be said, uh, said with the, the, you know, getting a sort of handle on actually who they were aimed at. And I'm reaching a sort of slightly pessimistic conclusion in certain instances that a lot of those that are produced in relation to the army are reflective of the fact that the the army establishment in Ireland post 1815 is that it's you know it's it's what three times what it was before 1800, and that there there is there is a there's enough of an audience there and they're sufficiently inward looking uh, for for that to su sustain and justify uh, the the the, uh, the the production. Uh, <clears throat> The, I mean, that's tied in. I, I still, that's tied in also with the with the whole question of, of, of precisely what are the runs of these of these prints, and in some of them, one one can conclude reasonably confidently, not least based on the frequency with which we encounter them in different collections, and which they still appear as available for auction, or are, or are to be found hanging in, in what remains of the houses of the Anglo-Irish, uh, which is where you're more likely to, to, to encounter them, that they may well have been sufficiently numerous to suggest that they were, the print runs were reasonably reason substantial. Some of the others, I, suspe I suspect, that you know, they exist in one copy. And, and some, I know on the basis of titles, there's no, I haven't been able to locate a copy at all. It may not have been extended, extended very far. So which ties in with your, with your first point, really, in terms of what, uh, what, what do we make of these, these caricatures of individuals. Um, I, was, I was tempted to, you know, it's probably not necessarily the wisest, the best one uh, to, to, to display, but I was, I was trying to provide two uh, messages with, the, with this image. The one is the, the fact that they, they, was, they were copying it, and their copies are, are on the face of it, not exactly very dissimilar to, to, to each other. And secondly is that there is, uh, by implication, one can get a perspective from the, the image itself that it's not especially ferocious. Uh, Philpott Curran, by this stage, no, they weren't commenting on his on his on his his ostensibly Catholic background. I mean, I was a long time in the back. They weren't even commenting on his, you know, his his troubled relationship with his daughter, or with indeed with true true uh, true uh, uh, Emmet. That's something that an, another generation of people looking back on Curran found interesting about him. They were commenting on the fact that after all the years, basically endeavouring to be in 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 in, in, in and all his years being in politics and being an opposition figure, he had effectively he become master of the roles. He was an officer of the law, and and that and in that capacity, he obviously had to. He, you know, there was a certain amount of travel in, involved. I assume I don't know, but there is another one of John Toller, who's who Lord, Nor, Lord Norbury, uh, who you know from another, who is known from the Emmet context as well. Uh, also on on his call a tolerable horseman, which is a nice, relatively nice pun, but it's a low key pun on on his name. Also on horseback. 
I think basically it's, there's a preoccupation during this year with horses that we can only understand from the, in the late 20th century, from the beginning of 21st century perspective of, the, of, of those people who are enthusiastic about cars. And it's, 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 that, it's that version. There's another ph phenomenon about this which I didn't go into, which is there's, a, there's this biographical, I mean, there was back to the William Cleaver image. There, is, there are dozens of, of, of figures, some of whom now, unfortunately, it can't be named, because or at least they have, I haven't named them as yet, including Dr. Whistle, um, who are contemporaries about town and who, who, for whom there was a market just in producing a caricature image in the same way as Martin Turner might they're more, more, they're more, invariably more. Tom Matthews, perhaps a bit better way, they might be better parallel. Who are, which are just, you know, exaggerating the individual, and that in itself, it's, it's, it's. I don't think they sustain always an awful lot more analysis than than that. But while, while at the same time, I mean, maintaining, and based on the differences that are there, that that is something. Uh, it, it is it significant, or I'm suggesting it was significant, that a lot of Gilray's you know, most savage political caricatures aren't reproduced, uh, while some of his more social caricatures are, and one can replicate that. So it's rather a, a, a sort of a longish answer to, uh, to your question, but um, the, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to think perhaps one of the things that we need to ultimately to try and come to acknowledgement of is, that, uh, is the extent to which uh, pre the emergence of nationalism, the extent to which Britain and Ireland were bound, or at least large elements of the, of the populace, I should say, the Anglophone populace of both communities were bound in this sheer cultural, political, and, 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 and uh, uh, parliamentary sphere as well. And, and, and if we see that in that context, it, 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 it's not necessarily uh, a, a, a context which people looking from a modernist perspective will necessarily find fulfilling, but it doesn't take away from its, actual, from its existence. So I have two questions. One is the fact that some of these images are exactly the same and others are mirror images of one another makes me wonder about the actual technologies that people were using to produce them. I wonder if you could say some things about that. And then my second question is, do we know anything at all about what people did with them after they bought them? Did they keep them at home? Were they displayed? Were they looked at once and thrown away? Were they passed around? Do we know anything about that? I mean, or were they friends? Yeah. yeah. No, that's a really, that's, both, both those are, are a key, a key questions. Um, the technology, I mean, the first point about it is I would, uh, I would, it's not an accident that these, these, these uh, images uh, emerge at the same time in Britain and Ireland. Basically, the technology allows it. It's not an accident also that by the time you get to the 1820s, uh, with, 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 with lithography, it's possible to move on to the next phase. Uh, it seems to. It, it doesn't entirely explain the the or the, the speed with which it seems to, dis to decline in Ireland. Um, but but that there's a there's a technological dimension which allows this to be done. Now, how they're done in technological terms is is really quite. Uh, is, is something, well, it's it's very elusive. We know that there there's a fairly vibrant uh, culture of engraving in in Dublin before this comes along, that many of those who were engraving for the various magazines who were, who were engraving very ordinary and you know, benign, um, classical and rustic uh, scenes for, for, for the various magazines of the day and so on. Uh, they, so, the broadcast being the case in point, move into, into that because frankly it's work. And, and, and so what, what, they, what they would seem to be doing in a majority of instances, they're, they're getting English they get an English uh, image, and effectively they engrave that, do a copper engraving of it. They, co they, they copy it, they put it on, on, on a piece of copper and engrave it. That's one of the reasons they're reversed. And so that's, that par that's partly the, the explanation. But beyond that, I, look, it's, it's, there is, uh, there's a myriad of aspects of, of these uh, professions and these activities that are impenetrable. Uh, because the papers that you would require, you need the working papers of, a, of an engraver or of, of a publisher. And I, and, you know, I mean, I threw it out there into the, to the room. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't even, I can't even locate uh, the, uh, Side Bottom's birth date. I haven't an idea. I know, I, and I, I stumbled upon it almost by accident when uh, McCleary dies. 
based on an abstract of a will. Um, but I don't know when he was born. I don't know what part of the country he was from. So at times you feel like, uh, you know, there's a famous you know, F.S. Lyons image going back a generation ago about that coming to write a history of Ireland. He felt like to be the ancient Israelite asked to make bricks without straw. I think in many instances, you know, you don't even feel you got to, you got not only not have enough of the straw, uh, that but you don't have enough quantity of, of 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 the earth that is required as well, or the heat isn't there. Now, what to do with them is is an even more interesting a uh, question in some senses, and because it goes to the heart of their purpose. And there are occasional, there are some hints, and um, <clears throat> a lot of them were purchased and basically were. I suspect they were they were brought into these large these there was various uh, social gatherings, predominantly male. I would I would hazard, uh, fairly confidently they were predominantly male, and some of them emphatically were were were, were, were for, for a male audience, and you know that in there as the evening went on they were taken out they would be poured over. Uh, others were used for certain political purposes. One can determine from some I images of, of, of uh, guard rooms and barracks that they were they were pasted on the wall um, and there. So and that's 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 pretty pretty uh, that's pretty clear actually that that's uh, that's what they were doing. They were essentially ephemeral. Uh, though collections were established, and, and uh, I mean this is one of the intriguing things about it. I mentioned the Pierpont Morgan. I mean the Pierpont Morgan collection uh, what drew me there was that that's where uh, uh, William uh, uh, sorry uh, Robert Peel's the, the British, early 19th century politician he built up a collection George the fourth himself built up a huge collection indeed in his own way was it was a, was curiously was while while being satirized by it was some, was subventing the satirizing that was taking place of himself um, and, and as everybody knows, Gilray, this is in England I'm talking about, of course, Gilray was, was, was funded uh, once Canning takes over by the, by, the, by, the, uh, by, the, by the by the administration. That's how they're funded, so they're, they're see them, how they've been distributed. The other way in which they actually impacted upon people is that they were, they were, they were hung in, in, the, in, the, in the print seller's own windows. Uh, so there were, um, and you, one never sees a, a depiction of those without a crowd being before it. So they they had a certain allure. W one would suggest. I mean, I've, I've bought some myself from a uh, from via Australia of all places, uh, and the the, the 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 retailer there was indicating when I was inquiring about how this how we'd acquire these, and I I sort of. To, to, to asked to toss him a bone, as it were, to say, look, it stuck me on the basis of that they've been assembled in a in a, in a, in a, in a um in a, in, a, in a folio of some kind, that people were collecting them. So there's a variety of, of options. Some people were collecting them for 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 because they in the same way as any of us collect anything. It just it reflects that collecting habit. Others were being utilized for more ephemeral temporal purposes. Some were just used for recreation and entertainment. And then well, I haven't, didn't engage with those, which I'd probably if Richard might have found that more interesting, engage with those that are purely political and uh, that were trying to give a political message. Any questions? Guy? Um, the Peninsula Dinner Party was a few things. Just in, in response to, to Richard's question, that Richard is, is not here, but the, uh, I, I think actually, to look at it, within, to compare it to the, the, the Gaelic uh, tradition wouldn't quite work, but what I would look compared to, I think I put it in the context of singing at the time, political singing, reflects a lot of late 18th century balladry, also in the way you described of people taking out the cricketers and pouring up, uh, over them in gentlemen's clubs, would relate to the kind of singing of you know, the Anacreon kind of societies, both in London and in Dublin. So that, that's just a, a comment on that one. Um, you know, it's interesting because lately these are very hot topics, right? Kind of histories of various emotions and how they work. You're saying a history of laughter in a city of laughter. These are hot topics in historiography. But the next question is, laughter changes over time. So you ask yourself, what kind of laughter are we talking about? And it seems to me that these, cari these caricatures are not about bursting out and rolling with laughter. It's more of a snigger. You know, we ask what kind of laughter it is. The key point here, and I think you mentioned it before, the puns, they're loaded with puns. You know, you have to recognize them and you kind of laugh at them. It, it's a certain kind of uh, a laughter which can be qualified, I think, better by through the detail of them. But, but the point I was thinking was about your chronology. So you've given us a history here from the late 18th century through the 1820s. 
And you already told us in advance, and it's quite clear, you know, it's very different from the cartoons we see of the 1870s in the late, 18, in the late 19th century, right? These are two different phenomena, technologically, and they're different in their frame of reference in the kind of cartoons. But I'm wondering about the demise of the 1820s. It seems to me it continues further. There's kind of this middle period of things move in between. I mean, think of all the cartoons. You show the Daniel O'Connell cartoons, right? Think of those that happened in the 1840s around Young Ireland and Daniel O'Connell. They kind of fit into this tradition and they kind of bridge it with what's going to about to happen later with nationalism, don't they? And the, the, the other aspect of that would be, that would also be a period, I think, the 1840s of popularizing these cartoons, when some of these caricatures begin to appear in books. The classic example, of course, would be Cruikshank appearing in Maxwell, right? In Maxwell's popular history. So there's a moment here where you say, this is not mass-produced. These are collectible items. But the 1840s seem to be kind of a period which changes and challenges that, but still continues. It's not dead yet. No, it doesn't die. I mean, that actually, that's, that is an important point. And uh, I mean, it, I was perhaps almost, you might seem almost obsessive in talking about single sheet cartoons or caricatures, uh, because basically it's a particular type of form. I mean, it's something I, I was, I'm conscious of, not least since I, in a previous uh, incarnation almost at this stage, I did uh, a, a collection of, of, of Gallo speeches. And I mean, what, what defined that? And I got partly criticized and partly complimented for it in, 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 in turn of that, was that it, it's, they just stopped. I couldn't find any after 1740 in that instance. And, and I, but the phenomenon of Gallo speeches being made didn't, uh, it didn't cease. And ditto, I mean, the, the, you know, people's, people's willingness to caricature, to satirize, doesn't stop in 1825. Or, you know, or even allowing for the, the, the Holbrook ones of the, of the Cat Association, or the Catholic Association, or indeed McCormack's of the 1840s. But there is a, they, are, they are different. I think, yes, I think perhaps I, I should be a bit more uh, emphatic and just simply state that the, the 1840s are an outlier and that they're, they're a bridge between, as you were suggesting, between what comes and, and goes, but that they, the tradition of what goes earlier uh, has, has changed. Because I, I think that I'm trying to make the point, or I, 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 I'm inclined to try to make the point, that it's, it's not that people stop laughing. You know, we, we never stop laughing. But what we find funny at a particular point in time and how we, how we, how we engage with what is, we, we, we perceive as, 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 as reasonable, it, it differs and, and, and varies. And uh, in that context, what, but my perception is that what's happening in the, by the time you get to the 1820s is not, it's, it's partly technological, as I indicate, but it's partly also there's a, there's a disposition that's emerging of, of which, which we, for want of a better term, just, uh, 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 define as Victorian in which there's a much greater emphasis on, on uh, and much greater censoriousness towards, towards, towards this form of, 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 uh, of presentation. Because there isn't, I mean, I, I use the word irreverence, and there isn't a re reverence in, in, in the attitude towards George III or George, or George IV or many of the politicians, uh, are, are, are indeed just the, the, the stereotypes that are being, uh, being highlighted in, in those images. Uh, in fact, it's, it's quite irreverent. Whereas the respectability that's, that's emerging and the respectability that's, that's already had its societal impact, you know, it's, it's, it's cleared out certain f uh, phenomena as, uh, in terms of re popular recreation and is to intensify, is to get into this realm as well. Now, the, in, 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 and so in that sense, you know, the, uh, I, mean, I don't see what's happening in Dublin is very different from what Gatrell basically perceives as happening in London. And it's it's it, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a different cultural realm. If you just you know spend days or weeks reading newspapers from the 1820s and then news from ones from the 1830s or 1840s, there's a, there's a different there's a different sense of, of concern, preoccupation. It's this is what history is about. This is what that's what we are trying to trying to identify and to try and 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 to and to and to, and to, and to describe. But in terms of the images themselves, I mean, I do think there is something slightly, uh, something also that we can, we can tease out. I mean, there's no question in my mind but that the images that uh, <clears throat> Alan was producing were more genteel, were softer. Uh, they reflected partly his audience. Um, it also, was, it was before Gilray. Gilray is a game changer. Because Gilray does bring a, you know, a, I mean, Sean Boris here basically would know this even better than I, but you know, in terms of Swift's Seva Indignatio, Gilray brings a, a, a Seva Indignatio to bear 
uh, to the world cultural realm in 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 uh, that, that few others can uh, and emulate, and it's partly a manifestation of his genius, uh, but you know, they, I mean, what he does with the reputation of Charles James Fox, the leading Whig politician, is, is, is Im, Im, you know, it's un, un, unfathomable, no measurable. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't think any contemporary caric ca caricaturist has, and even Ralph Steadman in his peak was capable of doing anything along, along as, 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 as cumulatively uh, destructive as uh, what uh, Gilray did there. And so there is a, you know, there is an intensification, but it doesn't quite go that far. It's not quite as personal as that. I mean, we, I, th I suspect we would have been, we'd, we'd find it much more engaging. It wouldn't have been as uh, occluded to the same degree that it has been if, 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 if that had happened. I mean, the only thing that comes, and I didn't engage with this because it basically doesn't fit the definition of the single sheet phenomenon, is, is Watty Cox's images in the Irish mirror. The only ones that, in a sense, that are, are, are overtly um, <clears throat> uh, more, more uh, political in, the, in, in that realm, and artistically. I mean, whatever people say about Waddy Cox, and I know people have, some people have attempted to try and uh, provide a more positive gloss on the thing. Artistically, they're pretty unsophisticated, shall we say, then. Uh, and though, though they are, you know, they, they are reflective, and it's in that context, I think, perhaps, I mean, the, as, as this moves forward, this project moves forward, what one will be doing is trying to work out these cultural realms, these smaller communities, in which, uh, which certain images attracted them. But, and, and, but that the publishers, those who were retailing them, you know, and you could go into Cy Bottom Shop on, on Lower Sackville Street. You could go into um, <clears throat> the Cleary's on, on Nassau Street and buy these images there. But if you went in, presumably, in the same way as you or I go into a bookshop, we don't go in and basically say, I just want a book. You know, you go, in, you, you go in and you choose and you select. Um, and that people were, were doing that there. So, and, and that's the, the, so the publishers were producing an array for particular, uh, not, not, they may have particular clients in some instances, but uh, for, uh, for the general audience of people who would come in and somebody would want a particular image. And, and, there, were, and there are, I suspect there are individuals, you know, who, who have specialized in that. There are lots more than, 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 than I showed of those biographical images, which are oftentimes very gentle. You know, they, 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 they're ones that lent, yes, lent itself to people saying, smiling at rather than, rather than laughing outrageously. Um, and indeed, in many instances, you know, most of us, I suspect today, if somebody drew a caricature of us and if it wasn't entirely offensive, would actually probably say, may I, may I, may I, may I keep that? And that may well be also a factor that, 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 that ob ob obtains. Uh, and finally then, in terms of basically, you know, the, the, the tradition, yes, I think basically, we're, I, I made that point earlier, they, it, it is reflective of a different tradition, that there are different mechanisms. Uh, the world of balladry, you know, is something where it's, it's I mean, there's a massive amount of balladry as well. Um, and there, and there, are these, these, there are these forms of sort of uh, human expression and human interaction that are taking shape and that uh, as our, our uh, approach to the, trying to explore the past expands, we're beginning to find space for them. As they were funded, as you mentioned, how much of the influence do they have as they were funded by others? Uh, that's a really difficult question because I mean, the, in, you may have noted the, the, the example I cited was of the Tory government in England uh, using the, and indeed to a certain degree, uh, uh, the Prince Regent funding uh, their, um, well, in the first instance, funding their publication. In the Irish context, it's, less, it's, less, it's, it's entirely less clear cut. Um, I, there, are, there are a number from the 18 teens which relate to the Catholic question, which I think actually were, 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 being, were being subsidized to some extent, or but there, was, there was somebody, uh, there was a political motivation in their publication. And if there was political motivation in their publication, it, it, it's likely that there's a political, there may well be a political um, incentive being provided that might be, might be financial. Uh, but it's, it's like, this is like nothing, any other piece of work I've done really in the sense that you're actually trying to take the product and then interpret the, the process by which it's generated. 
and uh, it's not the, it's 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 not like normal it's not like well, what's normal it's not like political history in the sense that you frequently trace the, ge the genealogy of a of a phenomenon or idea or even a political policy decision making in this instance uh, the, it isn't, there isn't the same liberty so any answer i'm going to give you is probably going to be ultimately highly unsatisfactory my suspicion is there's a bit more going on than than one would know i, I expect a lot of it is basically pure uh, opportunism on the part of the publisher, something happens. You know, there, for example, in 1812, uh, there was a, a, there were again in 1823 there were attempts to launch balloons, which created a sensation in the city, and so there were there were there were caricatures of this uh, produced, and which emphasised the, the semi raucousness of the occasion. You know, there was there was the discovery of a, a spa well in 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 Leak Slip in 1794 produces the same. I think they are pure opportunistic things. Some of the politics are opportunistic. These those have very short shelf. Those have very short uh, sale lives. Uh, some of the rest of them then may have had a bit more. So, uh, yeah, there's more going on than we're ever going to recover, or I'm going to recover. I fear on the basis of what I'm doing to date. Thank you.